Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for rejoining us here as we look forward to hearing the report out from our four success labs. Just as a reminder, as you enter the platform for today's program in the on your agenda section in that window, in the bottom left-hand corner is the Q&A button. If you click on that button, that will bring open that window that allows you to submit questions to today's presenters. Our first group explored considerations in organ donation, including, or excuse me, organ distribution, including transportation, distance, preservation, staffing issues, and mitigating multiple offers. So for the first Success Lab report out, I would like to welcome to the stage Dr. Mike Suter, Professor and Chief of Anesthesiology at Harborview Medical Center, and Katie McKee, Manager of Hospital Partnership and Donor Family Aftercare at LifeSource. Welcome, Katie and Mike. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. And it's quite a privilege to report out on a very robust discussion that thanks to the Alliance's uh, pre-planning included a really great representation of OPOs and transplant centers and people with a tremendous amount of experience in this community. So that uh, opened the door for really wonderful dialogue. As Dr. Suter and I were Debriefing the discussion a bit, we celebrated the fact that to move to solutions, one must first clearly identify the problems. And our discussion was rich with that. We talked a lot about, in detail, about some challenges that we um, will certainly, due to this type of discussion, funnel into solutions. But we really did um, get to some good problem definition, which was... Um, which was a wonderful element of our discussion. Dr. Suter really led off the discussion with thoughts around the dissonance between what donor hospitals are both experiencing, working through, and how their support and engagement in donation is part of a much broader picture, of course, that the dissonance between that and really the transplant center experience and how it is perhaps um, easily lost how all the dynamics that donor hospitals are dealing with. And so our group certainly related to this and had some good discussion around opportunities for um, just continuing to engage in dialogue that tries to bridge that dissonance, but certainly with no immediate forthcoming solutions to that dissonance, we quickly flowed into our first key theme, which was around visualization of donation in donor hospitals. We heard three excellent examples that were a bit different in terms of how OPOs are uh, achieving this visualization in donor hospitals. The first was from Kurt Shutterly in Pittsburgh, they have significantly increased their visual presence in ICUs and in donor hospitals, especially their largest donor hospitals, with shifts of individuals who um, really create that presence, both for assessing potential donors, but for family support, uh, relationship building on site. And um, Pittsburgh has seen really excellent results from that increased visualization that Kurt shared. Diane Brockmeyer commented on a slightly different approach, which is hiring individuals from hospitals, from the critical care um, community in hospitals to serve as sort of part-time resources uh, to advocate for and support um, presence, increased presence for donation in hospitals. And, and certainly that was described as quite a nimble model uh, for that increased visualization. And then Jennifer Marriott from Colorado really talked about regional models for well-established presence and relationships outside of the DSA's metro areas and how we sort of, at least in uh, large geographic, uh, we covering OPOs like ours have to treat metro areas and regional areas um, a bit differently in terms of how we uh, have that visualization. The second key theme we thought we would describe as um, uh, we the, 
the second key theme, what sort of bridged into that discussion was challenges around allocation. And that was very consistent with the survey results that um, as allocation models are changing, uh, how the whole community is responding to those. That was a key theme in the surveys. It was a very key theme in our discussion. What we heard about were really compensatory strategies around what Dr. Suter kind of called the law of unintended consequences. Um, and the first sort of category of um, backup system that a number of OPOs described they have been utilizing for quite some time and others expressed that they are quite interested in utilizing such backup systems were around having transplant centers who could really serve as, um, well, as backup systems to the first, uh, to the centers that are, their recipients are first on the list. So whether those are local centers who can say, yes, I have a local patient who I can have in ready and waiting, who has time to get a negative co negative COVID test, and who's ready to be transplanted, um, either locally, or we heard OPOs describe we have an excellent relationship with a transplant center that may not be local, but they we keep them abreast of the of the offer what's happening in the OR so that they have their patient ready to accept um, if indeed there's a decline in the OR. We heard described how um, post cross clamp, the rules sort of change when it comes to strategies that OPOs are utilizing to ensure that organs um, can be transplanted. The third theme was around provisional yeses. So related to kind of the backup system comments, but perhaps a bit of a different angle. Um, we talked about how with newer allocation models, a wrinkle of those wider allocations are provisional yeses perhaps mean something different to what they've meant before. And um, there's inconsistency in really what they mean. Uh, we talked about the challenges of evaluation and had really good input from Dr. Uh, Sung from Michigan, who provided some good insight to why uh, it is, from a transplant recipient perspective, often necessary or advantageous to really keep evaluating, especially um, provisional organ offers. We asked the questions, are there more dependable strategies? Is if indeed a center is number one or number two on the list, should there be a different level of commitment and a different meaning to provisional yes? Um, should there be a time limit? And we certainly did not answer those questions, but think that there's a lot of value in continuing to have that conversation so that there is a um, sort of more widely universal understanding of what a provisional yes means. We spent a good deal of time then talking about any solutions to these well-defined uh, opportunities or challenges really depending on the strongest possible relationships and communication. So the second theme around backup systems depended on tremendous amount of communication from people who know the players, from people who um, understand the practices of various transplant centers, from people who have relationships and can pick up the phone and say, you know, here's what's happening. We're keeping you in the know. Um, we have this relationship based on mutual credibility, and so we can backup plan with mutual understanding of, um, of what that means and certainly trust, uh, relationships built on trust. Uh, Dr. Suter described it as a continual streaming dialogue uh, that is required, use words like draft seasons, rich with statistics and probabilities, and indeed uh, with the changes that we're seeing that um, we are looking at models that depend more on tremendously variable statistics. Those relationships, the ability to communicate real time uh, 
and the ability to communicate real time based on well-established relationships was really um, the infrastructure or the foundation that we sort of left as any solutions that we come up with will need to be based on that, that fourth element. I would ask Dr. Suter certainly to add um, before we go into our Q&A. So uh, thanks, excellently summarized, Katie. I, I think that the only other thing I would uh, add was just, I, I think what some people described of as, as widening the scope of their medical advisory councils or their clinical advisory councils with regards to you know, the, the increased opportunities that teleconferencing such as we're doing now afford to us. It's easier to actually relate to people over wider distances and bring them on board. And I think that is probably going to factor more and more into building those kind of relationships that were alluded to uh, during the breakout session. So. Well, great. Thank you very much. Our, our first question is really building upon that last comment there, Dr. Suter and Katie. Uh, expanding the circle or the scope of your medical advisory councils, is that something that your institutions or organizations have already implemented? And if so, could you provide an example? Sure, I'll just speak to that very easily. We have started um, you know, asking the transplant surgeons uh, from Oregon who are you know, different OPO, they're down the coast from us, but we are seeing you know, um, increasing numbers of organs coming to, you know, going to them. And I think it's only uh, realistic that we see um, them being involved in our clinical advisory council and having uh, a contribution and a footprint in deciding what our protocols and management strategies and coordination you know, uh, should be when thinking about the, the OPO in general. So yeah, absolutely. And that is probably going to only be more, um, I think more frequently observed. We're talking about doing the same with you know, with the centers that we've been working with in, in Arizona and in, in um, Sacramento, you know, other kind of places like that. So I, I think that many people will probably be doing the same thing. I guess we have a we face the the risk that the more aggressive centres may find themselves oversubscribed in terms that everybody wants to be their friend, but you know I'm sure that will just find a new equilibrium that will actually let something meaningful come out of that. Great, K Katie. Anything to add on that question? When Dr. Suter posed it to our group, there was certainly a lot of head nodding as in we have an opportunity to expand our advisory councils and conversations, but I, I think the flavor we heard from the group was we're on the cusp of doing that, at least in most of our the OPOs represented in our group, um, and look forward to, to really pursuing that opportunity. Great. Yeah, it was interesting as the success labs uh, came together for the facilitator and the moderator, it, it was striking that to get from Katie's organization to Dr. Suter's organization, and we should also mention in the introductions that Dr. Suter is the medical director at Life Center Northwest, is really a three and a half hour to four hour flight. Uh, they really have such a broad scope of geography, massive geographies between those two OPOs. So it was really fitting to have both of them as leaders. Uh, with this success lab breakout. Just a reminder to those of you, uh, you can still submit questions in the Q&A button in the lower left-hand corner of your platform. Uh, feel free to submit those uh, as we move through this as well. Any other uh, real aha moments regarding uh, the relationship comments that you made towards the end of your summary statement there, Katie? Uh, it strikes me that as um, as public servants working for the public good, collectively transplant centers and OPOs alike, that really we have not only the relationship with, with around public trust, both for donation and transplantation, but also that ability to connect with individuals inside the transplant centers and our community or donor hospitals as there were, as, as we often refer to them, excuse me. Any other insights there that uh, would benefit the group as a whole from, from either Katie or Dr. Suter on relationship management? 
you know, we asked the question at the end whether uh, really leveraging those relationships in real time as allocation is happening, if anyone had a best practice for that. For example, are, is allocation being done by several people who really have those relationships? Is it more dispersed throughout the OPO? And I think the response was, hmm, best practice, we should keep working on this. But that that question of how how those relationships can best be accessed uh, real time and who in the OPO is really in the best position to uh, to be doing that complex allocation and those conversations. Um, we wish we would have had another hour for that piece of the conversation. And then another question for you around your first theme around visualization. So a lot of the examples that the, the Success Lab provided were really focused on staffing. Were there any other components to visualization taking place within the donor hospitals or did we really focus there on, on, on having people on site, so to speak? I think it was um, certainly the easy responses were driven by what people had already done with regards to staffing because that's what you have control over. You, you can actually you know, help that. I, I think that working with our donor hospitals, I still think we we have we still have ongoing challenges there. Nothing is ever uh, ha, has been perfectly solved in that domain. And as Katie said um, already, we've still got some continual displays of our dissonance of expectations from our transplant centres about how much you know, impact we can have upon procurement times upon mm -hmm. the investigation profiles upon the you know the transportations you know the, the timing um, you know of either you know, the, the continued donor management investigation and ultimately procurement and so I, I think that is something that we could still need to address and I I personally remain convinced that that really has to see uh, happen with a much more fundamental dialogue and bringing our transplant centers into our donor hospitals and opening up a new phase of a relationship there. I think that that offers some some opportunities. Yeah, that would be very interesting to, to build the relationship across uh, across the region, across the area, similar to what you've already referenced doing throughout the Medical Advisory Board really looking at how we support a region together and, and, and really a regional and a national waiting list. We're all collectively working together to ensure that there are more transplantable organs for Americans, uh, period, mm -hmm. not necessarily just those individuals in our community as well. Yeah, nicely put. All right, any last comments or questions for Success Lab number one before we let them go? Uh, hearing none, seeing none, we are prepared to say thank you very much to Dr. Suter and Katie for your leadership in that success lab and your succinct report out. Uh, be well, and uh, we look forward to connecting with you again in the future. Take care. Thank you. All right, we are getting ready for our second uh, success lab. A big thank you to Mike and Katie. Our second group examined waitlist challenges and the demand for organs, including patient identification management, listing of transplant candidates and organ selection, excuse me there. So I'd like to welcome to the stage our next two leaders for success lab number two. Dr. Anna Hands is the VP at Oshner's Multi-Organ Transplant Institute and Dominic Adorno is the VP of Clinical Operations at Life Center Northwest. Welcome to the stage, Anna and Dominic. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, this is Dominic. I'll re be reporting out for our success lab. Again, Anna uh, did a great job moderating our session. Uh, and just like the first group, we had a robust discussion, both represented from the OPO side and the transplant center side. Um, the topics that we discussed include patient identification and management, uh, transplant candidate listing uh, practices, organ selection, and, and also we discuss relationships. And what I found interesting in hearing Katie and Dr. Suter's report out was just how uh, 
how a lot of our discussions paralleled theirs. And I think when you when you think about the donation and transplantation systems and how interdependent they are, you start getting to the root of some of these topics, you're gonna start getting into the operational challenges. And that's exactly what, what we went through here. So I'll start with uh, the, our, our discussion opened up about you know how do we uh, get patients, the right organs to the right patients uh, in, the, in the most effective way. And we start talking about waitlist management. And one of the comments was shared about the advantages of broader sharing and that uh, as we've moved towards a broader sharing that has increased the number of organ offers available to recipients, which has allowed centers uh, the opportunity, more opportunities to get the right patients to the right, uh, the right organs to the right recipients. But that also creates a disparity of time. And what it turned out, what it often results into is who can respond to the quickest, get to the organ offer the quickest. And that allow that often fo fo forces OPOs to then go to an aggressive backup list. So we were talked about one of the important takeaways here is going to be to come up with a standardized way uh, of uh, expediting uh, organ offers out of the OR and standardizing that uh, process and making sure we have clear uh, fluid communication channels between the OPO and, and the transplant programs. Uh, an OPO representative talked about, you know, the challenges that there's often a lack of interest in viewing offers if, if the programs are not primary. And one of the responses to help address that was, how do we get the right information to the program? So making sure that the programs have all the appropriate information uh, uh, when the offer is made, that means all appropriate diagnostic testing and, and making preemptive, preemptive calls to make sure that our programs uh, know what's coming their way and seeing what what uh, tests they're going to need. Um, having one to two solid backups uh, to make sure that if for some reason that that primary candidate is not uh, going to be able to use that organ that we are able to get to a backup sooner. Uh, and then I was talking about the, the importance of getting to the decision makers. We talked a little bit about the third party uh, systems that are uh, helping support transplant programs with organ offers. And, and the challenges that poses for both the OPO and the transplant centers, as well as the benefits. Uh, one OPO commented that uh, it's been a godsend for them to have a service help them support all the organ offers uh, for imports. Uh, well, another OPO said it also makes it difficult to make organ offers. So just kind of that give and take, it's, it's really about how do we get the communication, how do we get the information to the programs uh, that they need to make the effective decisions. Uh, we, we talked about that some programs may be aggressive in accepting organs, but maybe not as aggressive in the OR. And again, I think that facilitated a whole separate discussion about what does it look like to get uh, the appropriate information to the program? So, and how do they get to their candidate selection? Uh, we talked about the accessibility of data for transplant programs. So when you have a large kidney list, how do you know which kidneys are able to accept which uh, offers? Uh, and especially after hours when you have limited resources. So we talked about programs having hot lists or, or lists that will be able to help them get to quick, uh, quickly identify which patients will accept um, certain organs, uh, whether those are DCDs, fatty livers, uh, organs that have a higher likelihood of having graft failure, uh, which which uh, organs are going to be able to get to the program or to the recipient hospital quicker, uh, which ones need COVID testing. All of that information is, is crucial for a, a transplant clinician to make a, a decision uh, in the moment uh, when they're given that offer. Uh, you know, some of the programs share that they have created surgical notes or, tra or templates that uh, have a, a, robust, a robust set of information about all of their recipients uh, and this is created sometimes at, at the uh, recipient or when they uh, come in for a listing, they know exactly how long it takes for their recipient to get to the hospital. Uh, again, what if they're, if they're authorized or have they consented for high KDPI kidneys and so on and so forth. Um, we also talked about uh, how do we increase the partnerships and relationships with our transplant program. So, uh, I'm also from the OPO that uh, works with Dr. Suter. So we talked about the clinical advisory committees uh, partnering uh, and inviting other uh, transplant centers that are outside of our you know, administrative local area 
start bringing them into our, our discussions as well. We talked about the importance of partnering with medical examiners and coroners um, and starting to focus on as broader sharing continues and as these distribution circles uh, change, making sure that we're starting up conversation with those programs that we're going to be more likely to be showing up on our on the lists. Um, we had, a, we had one program, you know, ask a question about how does a smaller program, uh, you know, grow itself when it has a very small risk tolerance, right? So if it's a small program, small numbers, the impact of any adverse outcomes is, is pretty, is much more dramatic for them. So we talked about the importance of starting slowly, but increasing volume over time and matching that donor risk with this recipient risk. And then, you know, maybe focusing on one risk at a time and making sure that everybody, like we had heard earlier from the Mayo Clinic, making sure that that program is all on the same page with what type of organ offers they're going to accept. Um, I think that summarizes a lot of what we discussed. Again, I think a lot of that was shared in, in the, um, the, the Success Lab number one's report out, so I want to go over the same information. But uh, Anna, I'll kick it over to you. Do you have anything else that you want to Actually, no, um, Dominic, I think that was a great summary. Um, I would only uh, emphasize that we talked a lot about the communication, especially between transfer programs and OPOs and understanding uh, the expectations for each part so that we could definitely um, do better with that challenge of, of placing organs into the right recipients. But that was a good summary. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Anna. Anna, maybe if I could ask you just a, a quick question there. Your transplant center, um, how do you ensure that that information at your facility gets into the right hands of the key decision makers? So we have, a, uh, I think we're pretty aggressive in many ways. And, uh, you know, first of all, we have a, a great relationship with our OPO. Um, we understand very well what the requirements are and they understand what we want uh, with the patients. Um, the way we manage our uh, recipients or potential transplants, um, we have a procurement team that we actually go and procure our organs. Um, so we make sure that uh, Dr. George Ross, you may have heard him say that we have sometimes organs that have a bad story, but they're actually pretty good when you go see them. So that's why we actually are able to transplant some of those uh, uh, organs that don't look really good. Um, and uh, I think uh, the process goes starts from, you know, of course, with the uh, procurement coordinators and they, we, we work 24 seven, like most people, our surgeons are at, whoever is on is on and we don't wait. You know, we try to make it as less call time as possible for the organs. And uh, we do have in place uh, sort of a decision tree. So it gets really quick to where it needs to go, the information. Um, but pretty much that's it. I, you know, a lot of what I'm assuming everybody does, you know, but ours is a pretty very well, well oiled machine, I think in a lot of ways, but I do think that the key is communication. Definitely. I'm going to go back to that because there have been times and we have had some struggles with our, um, um, not, not the OPO uh, the corners at some point. And, you know, we go as a team with OPO and, and talk to the corner and, um, try to figure out how we want to fix this. So, you know, overall, I think it's basically that a very good communication. Great. Thank you. Dominic, you mentioned in your summary that uh, there are continuing opportunities to build relationships with medical examiners and coroners in particular. Uh, were there any examples shared by members of Success Lab number two regarding how that has been impacted by COVID-19 or, or certain things that Life Center Northwest has been doing during this time? Not with respect to COVID-19. I think just the importance of whether it's physician to physician engagement. Um, you know, for us, uh, we, we, we talked about dedicated personnel. So that if that's uh, positions within the OPO liaisons, we're constantly working with the uh, coroners and medical examiners to, to kind of make sure that they're uh, engaging and, and, you know, constantly keeping donation as part of the discussion, whether part of morning rounds or whatever it is. I think the OPO is varying kind of how they approach their their relationships in terms of positions wise. But um, yeah, it wasn't, you know, I think just not a huge thing from, from COVID standpoint, but just, you know, just if we're looking to expand uh, utilization, making sure that, you know, organs are not being declined, authorization to release uh, 
organs are not being declined and really uh, preemptively presenting as much information as we can to get that organ released. Great, thank you. That was a horrible answer, sorry, but we didn't. <laughs> nope, really no, that's great. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Shannon. Uh, Shannon's question is, how do you think the 250 mile change will affect the smaller transplant centers as it will open up the radius to bigger transplant centers? Thank you, Shannon. And just a reminder, if you have questions, you have that button in the platform in the lower left-hand corner, please go ahead and submit those. So I can speak for our transfer program. I can tell you that uh, with liver, um, it has affected us significantly. Uh, we saw that very early on. Uh, reason why we are trying to be a little more aggressive with some of those uh, extended criteria organs or marginal organs, um, CDC uh, organs, uh, but uh, um, I, I, I do think that it, we haven't seen the impact for kidney yet. I guess we're going to start looking at it now when it becomes uh, uh, in place in, in a month or so. Uh, but we've seen it with uh, definitely with liver, significant impact. We've tried as much as we can, but it's uh, hurt us, I don't know, probably lost maybe about 15, 20% of our livers that we could have gotten here, which is a lot for us. Thank you. Overall, uh, success lab number two, how do they feel about the future of uh, the number of people who will be listed and the number of donors who will grow to match that demand? Was it generally a positive feeling coming out of success lab number two? And, and any comments in regards to that that you could share with the broader group? I'd say the overall uh, sense was optimism. I think there's a lot of work that needs to get done. I think um, especially as we're working through uh, policy and allocation changes and strategy changes, just kind of figuring out the best way uh, as you know, to, uh, to develop pro uh, relationships with new programs, um, to see the impact of broader sharing on logistics and making sure that, you know, we're again, like I mentioned earlier, getting the right information to the right people. And I think this, this has become more complicated as we continue on with these changes. So we, I think one of the themes that I heard in session one and session two is just a relationship building, whether that's the yeah. clinical yeah. advisory committee. We talked a lot about the importance of that effective relationship with the OPO on the transplant program. Obviously with, with the corners to, to some smaller part in terms of this success lab, but just in general, I think navigating those relationships and making sure that um, we're able to, you know, have those clear communication channels, I think is going to be what's going to help us, uh, you know, get through these next series of, of, of allocation policy changes. Well, Anna, Dominic, is there. Uh, thank you for your time and your leadership today in leading success lab number two. Appreciate your comments and, and your summarization. Definitely hear those consistent themes from success lab number one to success lab number two about it is a relationship business that we're involved in and open and succinct communication will be key to our collective success as we work to serve all Americans waiting for a life-saving transplant today. So thank you for your leadership and uh, be well. We look forward to connecting with you in the future. Have a great thank day. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Bye. Well, great. Uh, we are on to success lab number three, which is focused on relationship issues. Uh, key issues with relationships among the donation and transplant community of practice. For example, who are the key stakeholders? What are their main considerations? And how do you develop more effective relationships to develop an effective donation practices? I'd like to welcome two leaders who guided our success lab number three to the stage. Yvette Chapman is the Vice President of Business Partner Development and Client Services at Southwest Transplant Alliance. And Dr. Macy Henderson is an Assistant Professor of Surgery at John Hopkins Hospital. Welcome Yvette and Dr. Anderson Henderson. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin, very much. Um, so just one item of correction. My name is now Macy LeVan. Um, I recently was married and changed my name, but everyone in our community knows me by my first name anyway. So um, our success lab was focused on relationship issues, obviously within OPOs and transplant centers and hospitals. And some of the key themes that we came up with um, 
primarily included the virtual environment for which we um, are now living in. So one way to expand communication um, was to change this environment for which we are forced into, but it has created improvements for everyone, it seems like, on our um, in our breakout session. Um, things moving to Zoom has led for more um, less time spent. Um, there's been an influx of support for this. You don't have uh, people running around to one meeting a week. You can see three hospitals in one day or three hours. Um, so it certainly has improved the environment um, to be virtual. The other thing we discussed were virtual town halls. So in terms of that type of environment was focused on hospital leadership and making sure that hospital leadership was up to date on new policies, new laws um, and regulations. So particularly regarding OPO metrics um, and other types of new policies that may be uh, present. Making sure that those were known as well as updated were very important. Um, this was seen to kind of improve physician communication and engagement. And these virtual town halls, um, I think, have been done in many situations uh, in, in plenty of other areas of healthcare. And it has certainly been something that our group said was of value to them. Um, one of the other virtual uh, things to expand communication uh, were socially distant rounds. So one of the physicians, pardon, I don't remember everyone's, everyone's name, um, spoke about the fact that grand rounds and uh, patient rounding, no matter which way it is, they have to be done um, virtually or socially distant. So having a coordinator from the OPO listen remotely to those physician rounds when they're around the bedside with five people, um, or whether they're giving a big talk about donation, having people that are involved um, with the OPO process and particularly bedside issues would be critical um, to those bedside rounds. Um, one of the other things that was really important for expanding communication and building these relationships is something that I've heard um, from both Success Lab 1 and 2, um, which is the expansion of the clinical advisory board to other people. So whether it be transplant surgeons from other centers um, or OPO members from other uh, DSAs, um, this is something that I believe Kevin O'Connor mentioned in our group that was um, absolutely positive in terms of learning from each other. So involving an adjacent DSA. Um, but there was a, a challenge brought up to this. Um, unfortunately, sometimes these uh, involvement of different people from our outside borders could in encourage or uh, sustain more unwanted uh, competition that exists. Um, and so that is just one uh, aspect of that relationship building that would need to be uh, mitigated um, moving along into those expanded clinical advisory boards. Um, one of the last things specifically um, focused on expanding communication is sort of unified messaging. So OPOs need to kind of define strategies um, in order to sustain and um, always manage a unified message because hospitals and patients and donor families um, need to have that. And it is a key component to successful um, collaboration and communication. Um, oftentimes, we're not, I can't imagine that we would have different messages, but quite frankly, we do. And that's been brought up so many times um, in so many situations that I've been involved with that I think uh, strategic messaging that is unified across all parties is critical. Um, just one more thing about that. Having conversations within hospitals with staff, engaging them in understanding the donation message is certainly awesome. Uh, but one of the cool things someone on our group shared was, hey, you know, let's improve everything by just being nice. So one time, you know, what about buying Chick-fil-A was the example for all the ICU nurses and kind of facilitating this uh, openness and conversation um, while just kind of doing nice things for people, particularly given the challenging environment that we live in today. Um, so I'll move on to the next uh, overarching theme, which is about performance improvement and how do we in, uh, improve specifically around external stakeholder communication. And 
One opportunity that was brought up in our group was to use SRTR data to kind of understand where the mid and low performing uh, transplant programs are, um, as well as potentially donor hospitals with other data sources, uh, especially to understand volume potential um, and understanding that there may be a higher uh, donor volume potential from these smaller hospitals. Um, some of the, the focus on a small transplant program could certainly be a, a good thing because you could have more time, more communication. You could ultimately end up with um, more tissue recovery is what um, someone in our group said, as well as more uh, medical examiner. So ME um, office uh, collaboration, which I've heard from the prior group was really important. And although I'm not an OPO professional, um, I've heard from everyone in our transplant program uh, that this is a critical piece that often comes missing in, in many cases that, uh, that arise. And living in Baltimore City, you can imagine that that is something critical for our, our hospital. Um, one of the last pieces that I will speak of before I turn it over to Yvette, who is uh, a pro at the OPO issues, um, was this, this this idea of just texting, texting to communicate uh, with physicians. Um, and the text messages are a way to kind of allow for engagement without being too pushy. And uh, you OPO people that you have said to, uh, said to me that sometimes we are a little bit pushy with these physicians and this might be a way to, you know, stay available and present while not necessarily um, kind of diving headfirst into these types of uh, situations and areas. So. Um, with that, I think there are certainly challenges to all the relationship issues with keeping staff safe and keeping the business going. And um, I will let Yvette chime in now at this point because she brought up some critical issues about, you know, keeping us working. Um, and this communication is critical at this point in the world. And so with that, I will thank you and turn it over to Yvette. Thanks, Macy. So one of the other focuses um, we took was external relationship building. And a lot of our discussion today was around um, working in the midst of a pandemic and how that has affected our ability to collaborate. And it's not necessarily affected it negatively, it's just affected the way we approach it. So one of, the, one of the topics we were discussing was how do we also collaborate with our external stakeholders? And I gave an example of at the time the pandemic hit, our hospitals here in the Dallas area were just overrun as many of yours were. And ICUs were stretched to the max. Uh, staff in those facilities were um, under the gun from you know, risk of infection and just short, short staff. And we looked at external partner collaboration. We, um, I work for Southwest Transplant Alliance. And at the time we didn't have our own recovery center, but we were looking at a way we could reduce the burden on our, um, our hospitals with respect to the ICUs. We, we knew what the ventilator burden were. Um, and so how could we affect those? So we collaborated with a external uh, elective surgery center that was right near our office and that um, was essentially closed because at that point in time, all elective surgery, surgeries were, were stopped. So we had a beautiful new facility, this, this hospital that had multiple ICU beds. I think they were running four to six ICU beds and three to four ORs and fully staffed, but those staff didn't have jobs anymore because they were closed. So what we did, we partnered with them and built a relationship to where we could move our stable donors out of our, our hardest hit donor hospitals to relieve their, um, their ventilator um, burden and then be able to reduce the footprint of COVID. So what we were able to do, um, the hospital tested, the OPO tested, and once we had those confirmatory tests and the donor was stable, we would move them to this recovery center, this outside elective surgery center, could control the donor OR time, could control COVID to the best we all know that we could, and provide continued jobs for the hospital staff as well as our staff. And so that was just another example of how, if you look through a new lens at building relationships, 
um, the relationships that come from it, such as an external surgery center that was out of work, essentially, uh, was beneficial to our our mission. The mission of all of us on here is to reduce the wait list. And we were able to continue donation. We were able to continue transplants through that, ex uh, that additional relationship and partnership. So that was just uh, one of the many topics we had about, you know, building relationships and the importance now um, as as a primary focal point as as any point in time in in this history that we're living in right now. Yvette, is that relationship still in play today? It is. Um, we just, um, STA just opened a new facility. We built a new building that also has a recovery center in it. And uh, our recovery center is just about ready to open. But in the interim, we are still using that. And right now, Dallas is number three in the country in COVID infections and, and um, death rates as well. So we are needing to use that more than ever. Um, we haven't got back to the point where there's no elective surgeries, but they that surgery center is certainly backing off and, and being more um, cautious again on what is uh, deemed more necessary than others. Sure, sure, absolutely. Dr. Levan, any comments uh, during your group about how COVID is impacting historically low or medium volume hospitals and in relationship building in those areas as well? Anything that you might be able to share with the, the broader group? Well, I think COVID has impacted every hospital, whether it's small, medium, or large. Um, and our group did talk about an opportunity with COVID to focus on the low to, um, to mid, you know, performing hospitals um, for uh, donor recovery. And I think that's important. I'm, I don't work at an OPO, so I could let Yvette chime in on whether or not that truly is panning out within this pandemic. But um, certainly focusing on performance, I think is really important because those relationships you can build, um, you can build closely in environments like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not, so not that um, we should ever overlook our, our medium to low volume donor centers, but this was a time that in our conversation, this was a prime time to, um, to make those connections and build those relationships with those facilities, because these are the facilities that are not able to transfer their patients, where in the past, oftentimes they would transfer potential donors to more high volume, more um, uh, higher acuity settings. And now they're getting pushback. So now is the time to really be um, working on those uh, relationships in those facilities to support them and also not miss those potentials for donation. Great. Certainly appreciate the continued themes around communication and relationship building. Uh, certainly you've had STA's example about you don't know who your friends are. So everybody is your friend, really. Right. Uh, whoever guessed the ambulatory surgical center down the street would become a life-saving partner yeah. and how incredibly meaningful that work must be for that team there as well. Oh, so they, what they've been able to experience from it is something that um, we would have never thought would have been a benefit, but it surely has been. Yeah, that's fantastic. Any final or closing comments? Again, the, the, chat the community or excuse me the q a is open for those who are watching at home or uh from the comfort of the office wherever that may be or the basement uh in today's era that everything is going on so we just have corey is is telling me we do have a question that just came in communications and relationship building seem to be an underlying topic of discussion in all success labs my question is what type of ongoing formal training is being provided to OPO and transplant staff? Any examples during Success Lab number three about formal training that was going to OPO and transplant staff? We didn't talk directly about that. Um, I can tell you one of the things that in, in my OPO that we've been working on is creating a digital library, if you will, for um, the methods in which we used to um, deliver the message of donation um, is changing. So to do so, we created um, a more of a digital format so that we could push that out, followed up in, with an in-person when available meeting. But with respect to just how to communicate better, 
uh, how to build on those. We didn't have any of those specific lines of communication or a discussion around that kind of communication. Okay. That's a good point though. I, I mean, we all know that it comes down to communication. And so that is a very valid point that um, a formal, um, you know, more of a formalized process on just how do we communicate better in this era? That would be a great topic for all of us. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. I just want to add one more thing and it may be uh, pretty obvious, but make sure everybody knows how to use Zoom, right? Like we have, tr we have training at Hopkins are sending emails all the time about making sure everybody knows how to log in. They know how to have their own meeting rooms and set up those things. So, I mean, formal training and, and undergoing these types of situations where you're doing virtual presentations, virtual meetings, um, but just the basics of technology, I think are probably important to include in formal training. Absolutely. And certainly appreciated your comments earlier about um, facilitating communication, maybe as simple as text between physicians. We certainly at MidAmerica Transplant have experienced that between uh, our largest donor hospital is also a transplant center. And the physicians have reached out in this new era and said they actually appreciate the ability to communicate back and forth with our frontline staff via text. Uh, so that is a satisfier or perhaps a delighter as we would term it internally as well. So we are learning each and every day and certainly appreciate your comments about be nice and be kind. Uh, if I was tracking social media correctly, earlier this week or late last week was be kind day. So it appears your, uh, your comments were right in line there as well. So again, thank you, Dr. Levin and Yvette for your time in leading success lab number three. We greatly appreciate your leadership and your insights. And we uh, look forward to seeing you in person sometime in 2021, fingers crossed. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you, Kevin. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I hope you have a lovely week. Be well. Bye. All right. That brings us to success lab number four. Our fourth group tackled financial issues and helped develop financial models for sustainable organizations. Topics included developing relationships between transplant centers, hospitals, and OPOs for improving organ utility introducing new technologies, increasing the number of transplants performed and economic performance and contracts. Certainly when I jumped into success lab number four for a brief time, it was a, who, who, a who's who of OPO leaders. Uh, it was facilitated and led by Dr. Kieran Dahanredi, who is the executive director at Tampa General Transplant Institute and Dr. George Mazarigos, director of pediatric transplant at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Gentlemen, welcome to the stage. Thank you for providing us with an overview of Success Lab number four. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, hello, everybody, and it's great to be here. Um, I'll kick off our summary and, uh, and then have Kieran um, hit off some and compliment some of the points that were raised by the very robust discussion. My only disclosure is that I'm Chief of Pediatric Transplant in Pittsburgh, not Philadelphia but uh, um, it's great to be with the, whole, with the whole team here. We had a very good, ro uh, robust discussion and we did have some transplant center representatives as well. Um, like the other success labs, we identified that the relationships were really key to, to taking the next step in, in having a complete financial picture. Um, and I think the second, the second theme that was strong in our session was that this is an an area obviously of a lot of flux, a very dynamic area, not only because of the challenges that we're facing, but because some of the, the, key, uh, the key areas that we, we talked about uh, involved innovation and how, to, and how to properly move the field forward uh, while uh, being fiscally responsible. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a very dynamic area as everyone can appreciate. Um, the, first, the first discussion point that we centered on um, through a survey instrument was economic performance, and one of the one of the areas that we realized in our discussion uh, that would that we would want to define further for uh, for further success labs would be just commonality about what economic performance means to transplant centers, OPOs, and and donor hospitals. Uh, we talked about the contribution margin per transplant as being what the transplant center typically uses. But we also identified the challenge between uh, the transplant uh, margin, contribution margin, 
and the need to um, to increase volume and the need to serve the most um, challenging cases or the most at risk patient populations and how to um, how to distinguish between individual margin versus versus uh, uh, pro, uh, organ transplant margin or center margin. Um, and that there may be a, a better metric to use moving forward. We talked about the typical yardsticks for performance, which the group identified as volume, access, as well as outcomes. Uh, but one of the one of the areas that one of our speakers, um, one of our participants brought up uh, was to not forget about staff experience and staff um, uh, quality of life, if you will, in terms of the challenges that we're facing. And that that's a that's a metric that um, we also will need to consider in the future moving forward um, as we measure these different different changes that we make as a transplant program. We spent um, this, the majority of our time talking about innovation and we largely talked about innovation in the context of um, machine perfusion of organs and gave different examples from uh, Kieran's experience and uh, from, um, from other participants' experience in kidneys uh, or, or lung uh, and liver perfusion. Um, and there were four, four points that I think are very, um, that were very uh, stimulating for the discussion. Um, one is that we have to ask, um, what is the purpose of the innovation and is the metric uh, properly uh, clarified as leading to more transplants? And what's the best metric to measure innovation like organ perfusion? We had a great uh, point brought up uh, by, I think it was Missy in our group about unintended um, negative impacts of innovation. For example, if the if an OPO is bearing the brunt of, of um, the staffing requirements for organ perfusion at the cost of, of their own quality of life or staff, um, staff hours, how is that, how is that um, properly shared among the transplant center? And there were a couple of models that really brought up how that, that needs to be shared more effectively and transparently so that everyone uh, can bear the, bear the cost of this, uh, of this uh, innovation, in this case, organ perfusion. Um, the third important point that was brought up uh, by, um, by, uh, by Howard, Nathan was, uh, and others, were really to look at uh, that innovation needs to be targeted to the proper population. Um, and so one of the ways to be fiscally um, and financially successful in, in using innovation is to make sure that we're targeting the right population. And the community discussed that that was perhaps not consistently happening right now for a variety of reasons. One, we don't have a lot of data uh, to support the um, perhaps the best use of the of the technology, uh, and we and we and we need to have more sharing of of this type of data on a larger scale, so so we can understand who are the best populations to use it and the most cost effective way. Uh, and then Barry Friedman and others uh, brought up uh, the the importance of of understanding uh, at least the triangle or the uh, the rectangle of the of the various um, forces that we need to balance in innovation, which are the transplant center, uh, the OPO, uh, CMS or the payer, as well as the policy, the impact of policy changes that are that are happening that you have all already discussed in your in the earlier in the earlier labs and how to how to properly keep all of these relationships. Um, uh, uh, stated, understood, and, and factored into uh, reimbursement models moving forward. And the group summarized that there, that there is a lot of variability. It's a, it's a very dynamic and evolving area and one that, uh, that needs more, um, more work for us to really be able to um, not disadvantage one group while, while pushing forward important innovative um, approaches. And then we, um, after the innovation discussion, we talked about the current and future challenges, uh, focusing on a few a few areas, uh, the disparities, and looking at how we need or how centers have uh, targeted uh, and benefited or try to benefit special populations, whether it was uh, a disease population, a, a demographic uh, population, or a um, uh, or a, in the case of pediatrics, for example, the adolescent population in the and in different phases, both before and after transplant and how to make the argument to the administrative leadership uh, that may support 
um, uh, policies or staffing of programs that are not immediately reimbursable but do impact on outcomes. And this could include a reducing rate of, of um, alcoholic um, uh, recurrence or improving adherence uh, in the post-transplant period. Um, we talked briefly about other challenges of center size, as has been brought up by the other speakers, uh, medium and small center versus large center challenges. Um, and we talked, of course, about the need to fundamentally, with all innovation, for example, um, that we're considering the uh, safety, not only of um, patient outcomes, but also donor recovery outcome teams and, and how, um, how further increased cost and, and uh, travel uh, must have, has to be balanced against safety for the teams. Um, we left we and we closed by talking about uh, the gap. Um, the group felt optimistic that that innovation and the future, like was mentioned in the other group, would would lead to uh, an increased number of transplants and not a decreased access, access. But also that the that this put on all of us in the community, both OPO and transplant uh, centers, the need to innovate in relation to uh, better utilization of, of underutilized organs, so the older population, the more marginal donor, that that continues to be a need. The only immediate, say, one to five year um, strategy for, for really closing the gap between transplant volume and, um, and availability. Um, Kieran, I'll turn it over to Kieran just who, um, who did a great job of, of uh, kind of trying to get everyone to participate for his, his thoughts on our, on our session. Uh, thanks a lot, George. Uh, like you said, we had a, a very engaged group uh, of many OPO professionals as well as um, some transplant center professionals. And uh, I think I, I continue to realize how unique every transplant center and OPO relationship is uh, across the country. And um, I had the pleasure of having Liz Lear, my OPO partner, in our session um, and realized that our relationship is different than the relationship between other OPOs and transplant centers. And we did spend some time talking about how the allocation uh, changes have kind of uncoupled uh, local centers from their OPOs and maybe what the financial implications of that uh, are in regards to organ acquisition charges and how in the past uh, the local uh, OPO OAC was much more impactful on the financial performance of the local transplant center and that seems to be less important as more organs crisscross uh, in the air over the country. Um, and how we still have an opportunity and really a responsibility to continue to partner tightly, uh, maybe most so on the marginal organs and the older organs and the DCDs where uh, they're more likely either by allocation rules or uh, center aggressiveness to stay local. So it's not that we're completely uncoupled, but maybe our financial performance is, is a little bit less so. Um, I think that the more tightly we coordinate, the more likely the donor pool will uh, meet the need in the future as we were talking about. Um, uh, as I think it was Barry that brought up that there are, are plenty of organs that are, are going to waste or discarded um, because it's difficult um, or impossible to find the appropriate home for them in, a, in the right transplant center at the right distance with the right uh, risk tolerance. Uh, all of these factors, of, of course, uh, impact the financial performance of both the OPO and uh, the transplant center. Um, I, I think center size was a part of the conversation, as you mentioned, and uh, really the large transplant centers being able to distribute uh, financial as well as clinical risk I think continues to put pressure on smaller and medium-sized uh, programs, especially with allocation changes. Um, how do you uh, invest in the infrastructure necessary to address disparities, as you, was you were mentioning, uh, George, whether it's for pediatric patient populations or, um, or uh, racial minorities or geographically disadvantaged uh, populations that maybe live further from transplant centers. Uh, if you are a medium or small-sized program, that's harder to do. Uh, whereas the larger programs might be able to commit resources um, and actually physically send their teams to uh, clinics that are two, three hours away because they have the redundancy and uh, in capabilities and capacities to do that. Um, how this uh, affects the long-term financial health and viability of smaller transplant programs, um, I think remains to be seen, but is, is certainly a significant concern 
as competition increases. Thank you both for that summary. Uh, Dr. Mazarigos, my apologies for getting the wrong Pennsylvania City affiliated with you. Didn't mean to imply you were an Eagles fan. You might be hanging out with Rick Haas and some other shady characters on the other side of the state there. We, we uh, are we are nine and zero right now, so we have to enjoy that for a moment. I, I would say you should. Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't have a banner in the background or something promoting that uh, moving forward. Dr. Dahanreddy, you certainly appreciate your comments around uh, making sure that the local transplant center and the OPO are not uncoupled, which I think is a, is a unique descriptor uh, as we've talked about relationships in all four of these success labs. We certainly, while not a small transplant center, we've seen that with our local relationship with Barnes Jewish. In 2019, uh, Barnes Jewish accepted and successfully transplanted three livers from DCD donors in year to date, uh, obviously with liver allocation changes in 2020, they're at 15. So when we talk about those, those changes in, in older or what are considered more complex organs, we certainly have seen the need to stay in close proximity and communication with our partner, which is you know, literally across the street from us. So those comments were, were great. Any other, uh, we have one question from Kevin Meyer. I'm not sure if it uh, is best suited for this group, might be the last group, but uh, did, were there any references uh, regarding anyone using telemedicine to actually manage donors from remote locations? Did, did anybody in Success Lab number four share any experiences regarding the use of telemedicine? Uh, we didn't talk about it from donor management standpoint. Um, we talked about it from uh, the transplant center perspective and really about uh, meeting the need in geographically uh, distant uh, areas from the transplant center. But I, I would be interested to hear if, if uh, you know, tele-ICU technology is being used uh, by OPOs to manage donors. Yeah, just a reminder to the group, if you have an example uh, to the broader audience, if you have an example about how tele-ICU is being used to manage donors, you can put place that in the general discussion tab, and we will do our very best to integrate your answers into tomorrow's sessions as well. If you have anything you would like to share there, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, the next is not necessarily a question for either of you gentlemen. It is really just a reminder for that Gift of Life Institute has formal training in uh, HD communications. I believe that was from the last session as well. So um, again, appreciate your comments regarding relationships, communication, and also uh, what is the purpose of the innovation and who is it in design? Who is the audience that that innovation is designed to impact? Uh, and what data are we using to drive that innovation? Certainly, uh, Dr. Mazarigos, your comments earlier about what are the un sometimes the unattended consequences as we seek to innovate and move things forward as well. Gentlemen, any closing comments or observations from the day as we begin to wrap things up? No, I think that we uh, we also felt that really we're just touching the surface of the the the, the challenge or the tension between innovation and uh, and finance uh, and that that uh, additional additional time would be well spent in the future looking at um, truly transformative uh, technologies like uh, drone transportation or of organs and implications uh, for that or what what the truly uh, transformative um, impact of, of uh, innovation will look like more than you know, five or ten years from now, and that that's um, that was really uh, uh, something that we just we just really uh, didn't have time to obviously to go into. I would say that it's a, a very exciting time uh, to be in transplantation. Uh, a lot of changes happening in a very small space of time, and it's our responsibility as transplant professionals and advocates for our patients to figure out how to manage all that change uh, in the best interest of our community and our patients and. Uh, as it happens uh, in a financially responsible way, uh, because otherwise we can't uh, continue to innovate and grow and meet the need of more patients if we can't manage the finances. So exciting time, but also lots of challenges. Gentlemen, thank you very, both very much for your leadership and guiding today's success lab number four. We really appreciate your time and expertise and everything you do each and every day to save lives through donation and transplantation. Take care and be thank well. You. Thank you. As the program closes out for the day, I'd like to thank all of our participants. Thank you for staying active and engaged during our four breakout success labs. 
We really appreciate your continued contributions as we all strive to ensure that there are as many transplantable organs out there as possible. And we are able to all live up to the missions that our organizations have. I'd like to welcome Dr. Tom Nakagawa to share his thoughts about the day. In addition to being a professor of pediatrics, Dr. Nakagawa currently serves as the medical director of the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at Wolfson Children's Hospital in Jacksonville, Florida. Dr. Nakagawa serves as the Assistant Medical Director for Carolina Donor Services and also as a member of the Alliance Board of Directors and an important member of the National Critical Issues Planning Committee. Dr. Nakagawa, welcome to the stage. Well, good afternoon, friends and colleagues. <clears throat> Kevin, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. And thanks to all the Success Lab leaders for a great summary of their sessions. And to everyone who's still with us, thanks for hanging in there through a great first day of the National Critical Issues Forum. It's, it's really a privilege for me to close out day one. And even though we have to meet virtually, I think we've had a great first day. There's been great discussions uh, and uh, presentations. Now, that being said, um, I do have one of the most important jobs, which is uh, to provide a wrap up of today's great sessions. And importantly, I'm also the person that stands between you and happy hour. So I'm gonna try and keep my commentary short and to the point. But just to put in a word because of my specialty in pediatrics and pediatric critical care, I do wanna share with you um, a, a story um, that occurred in, in my unit uh, with a very talented group of um, nurses, therapists, physicians, residents, uh, respiratory therapists, dietitians, pharmacists. Um, in a span of five days, about three weeks ago, we had three pediatric donors ranging, ranging from two months of age to 15 years of age. And during those five to six days where we worked on those donors, um, I was so pleased to see a beautiful culture of people who really wanted to help make something good come out of a bad situation. From those three pediatric donors, we actually recovered 17 organs and 17 organs were transplanted. And I'm extremely proud of the team that I get to work with every day and that I get to lead in the pediatric intensive care unit. So just a plug for pediatrics, everything that you're doing in adult medicine, we're also doing in pediatrics. I do want to personally thank all the presenters throughout the day. I think they've done a, uh, just an outstanding job. And we've had the opportunity to hear excellent presentations um, from national leaders and experts and to join in some uh, very, very robust dialogue. And it's been a pleasure for me to, to listen to these conversations and actually learn from my colleagues across the country. Uh, as we close out the day, I thought I'd just take a few moments and provide a few additional insights from our speakers today. Um, we heard really important data information from Don, uh, John Snyder and Andrew Way this morning um, on how we can utilize data for performance improvement, including data about wait lists, OPO data, uh, data about acceptance offers and transplant outcomes. And, and John provided a very nice example of, of comparison data from two separate liver transplant centers. Um, and he showed how data can be used to compare programs to bring about action to improve other programs and important data about where we are and where we really need to be. We heard from Dr. Mather from Mayo, who continued to expand on the data and talked about how their program wanted to do more transplants and needed to meet the needs of their waitlisted patients uh, any way they could. And he talked about the culture of change and the culture of we and not I and how strong leadership between the medical and the surgical uh, groups helped really change that culture. And he mentioned the readiness for changes driven by team members wanting to change, not having to change. He also talked about the utilization of non-traditional organs, including DCD livers. Um, his important message was that liver transplant programs have the opportunity to evolve and they must in order to meet the challenges because of the scarcity of organs in the current allocation and distribution environment. Howard Nathan shared wonderful insights about the system changes that have occurred through the years and the need to achieve better efficiency for the donation and transplantation process, and really the need to better uh, the need for better technology to enhance allocation efficiency. 
the goal to get the right organ to the right patient and to improve the efficiency of organ allocation in a time when median hours of procurement have almost doubled from more complex donors, uh, yielding fewer organs, but resulting in more transplants. Um, what I found really fascinating was a photo of an unusual single line corded device with push buttons, uh, a single line telephone and mention of an answering machine, um, both of which are now actually featured in the Smithsonian Institute. Richard Gilroy's destination thing, you reminded us that liver transplant programs, the impact of outcome is mitigated by volume. And he asked the important question, how do we achieve the best outcomes and maximize utilization of our resources? John Gutowski shared insights into financial challenges, including travel costs, such as private and commercial transport, pilot availability, and the regulations uh, that they face, better understanding of staffing challenges, um, patient readiness for transplant, surgeon availability extended to our time in ICU stay, uh, all tied into reimbursement for services, and then balancing all of this with the ultimate goal of saving lives through transplantation. And of course, we heard a beautiful connect to purpose story from Glenn Matsuki, who's a heart transplant recipient and one of our own, a longstanding member of our donation transplant community who spoke about receiving a heart transplant and his journey to give back to our community, as well as the growth that he has experienced in the field over the past 25 years. I do want to take this opportunity to say thank you to our sponsors who Without their support, this event would not have been possible. Our signature sponsors, Bridge to Life, eHealth Technologies and Transmedics, uh, and our contributing corporate sponsors, CareDX, Paragonics, and Vivo Perfusion. We welcome your feedback on today's sessions, and it's important that we get that feedback. So look at the survey button on the left-hand column of your screen there, and you'll find surveys for all of today's presentations. Please take a few minutes to complete those brief surveys because your feedback's important and it's extremely valuable in helping us plan future events. The Alliance continues to develop a very strong portfolio of learning activities and opportunities for solutions. Additionally, we have recently relaunched the website with a fresh look and access to make tools, resources, and educational programs actually more easily accessible for our professional partners and our broader organ donation transplantation community. So I would encourage you and your colleagues to actually visit that website at www.organdonationalliance.org when you have the opportunity. The Advancement Webinar Series for 2021 focuses on several different topics in donation. Um, and we're excited to share the 2021 uh, webinar topics with you here today. So remember by registering as an Alliance Professional Partner organization, your entire organization um, actually will receive complimentary access to all of next year's webinars. So visit the Alliance website again for more information. So as we close, out today's program. I want to thank each and every one of you for being a part of this program. Uh, hopefully we can virtually socialize this evening and we do look forward to seeing every one of you back here tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 a.m. Pacific Time. You can access the forum with the same in login credentials that you use today. To all of you, Thank you for all you do to help save and improve the lives through your work with donation and transplantation. Please stay safe, be well, and spread kindness.